getting started for today. Um, this is the Apple Packaging Hackfest at the CentOS Dojo. Uh, I don't have any slides prepared. I'm intending for this to be just an open, you know, collaborative session. Uh, please join, share your camera, and talk. And uh, I've got a few demos of things I wanted to go through um, just together. Like I said, just go ahead and join whenever you're ready. Uh, if you want to talk or ask questions, uh, it'll be open to questions. One of the first things I wanted to highlight is a tool that Troy, uh, Troy Dawson, has been working on um, to help us identify packages that are having problems installing on uh, on Apple. So let me share my screen. Nope, wrong button. This one. All righty. Can everyone see that more or less, or should I zoom in a whole lot? All righty. Uh, so this is a uh, kind of a status page, and it has a lot of information about packages that will not install currently. Uh, there's an equivalent one for Apple 8. Uh, what will happen a lot of times with this is that a package may build and have all its build requirements uh, re available to in order to build, but then have some missing runtime requirements. Sometimes that's just on a particular sub package that might not be as interesting. Uh, one example there that jumps out to me is the F35 backgrounds XFCE. Uh, that that has a hard requirement on the XF XF desktop, which isn't an Apple nine yet. But the other sub packages from that build are still useful and installable with when their dependencies are met. So um, I was talking about that with someone else and suggested maybe the solution there would be uh, changing that requires to a recommends. Um, that's just one example. Another example I wanted to go through on this one, I looked at this earlier. There's this tool called Dehydrated. I think it has something to do with Acme and certificates. And the problem that it's having is that nothing provides the mailx command. So mailx is uh, here is that uh, mailx provides the mail command. And my first thought is that. Uh, that might not be something that's necessary because a lot of packages don't, uh, they'll have requirements that aren't necessary, but they're still listed in the spec file. So it prevents the installation. Uh, some of those like the previous XFCE example, those are useful to change to recommends instead of requires. Uh, but let's take a look at what dehydrated, uh, why dehydrated has that one in there. Well, first thing actually, before I do that, when you're, this is the, uh, disk it for the dehydrated package. If people have seen this before, there's some handy links in here where you can go straight to Koji builds, uh, Koji uh, Bodhi updates and bug reports. I'm gonna open that one in the background. It takes a little bit to load and get to the spec file. So one useful trick you can do for tracking down uh, dependencies and why they are there is to do, do just a traditional git blame. And of course you can do this in a terminal uh, if you check out the repository. Uh, we, we're just going to do it here in the web browser. Chat log's already scrolling past me. Let me look. Da, da, da. Yeah, that's what uh, Neil's jumping ahead to what I found the solution was earlier, but I'll, I'll work through the steps of how I got there. So, uh, so looking at this git blame, I'll see here's, the, here's where it has a requirement on MailX, and I can look at the commit that added that. It looks like uh, it at, it was when this package was updated to 070. Um, but if I look at the actual changes, not just the commit message, I can see that there is this dehydrated cron bash script that got added. Um, the cron name's a little bit of a misnomer because it's actually called by this uh, dehydrated.service, which is a system D timer unit. And so if we look at that, it's actually calling the mailx command directly. It's kind of hard to see directly in that script. How's that as far as zoom level? Hopefully better. So that is what, so it makes perfect sense that if they're calling the mailx command directly that um, they have a requirement on that. However, whenever uh, mailx is a command, there are several commands that provide the command user bin mail and user bin mailx with the alternative system. In, in, in rel nine and CentOS stream nine, that's actually provided by a package called s-nail. So 
my my suggestion for this package would be filing a Bugzilla. And I mentioned the Bugzilla list earlier. I opened that up to see if there was already an open Bugzilla. That's always a useful thing to check. Uh, and again, this this page is, I got to that page by going in Diskit. There's this bug reports button here, and that'll take you to a list of all the currently open bugs for the package. There's also this really cool trick that uh, I, I haven't seen documented many places or anywhere really that uh, I found out about. If you just type, if you go to bugs.fedoraproject.org and then the package name, that will redirect, and that's bugs with a Z, B-U-G-Z dot fedoraproject.org slash package name. That'll redirect you to a Bugzilla query of the same thing. Open bugs for that package in Fedora and in Apple. So there's no open, there's this open bug, but that looks completely unrelated to this dependency. So uh, a new bug will be appropriate for this package. Basically to say that it is in Apple 9, but it's uninstallable because no, there's nothing providing the MailX uh, package name. There is something providing the MailX by command. So I think the best solution for this probably would be uh, to change that requires on MailX to a requirement on user bin mail X, which will be resolvable by, uh, it'll be resolvable by either package mail X or S nail on Fedora. But then when you build it on, uh, on Apple for Apple nine, it'll get resolved by S nail. Let's see. Catching back up on the chat. Oh, that would be a good, uh, feature, Michelle, a file new bug button. We can go through that. In fact, Navigating Bugzilla is something that a lot of people um, shy away from. I've had I've had people tell me directly that they can't be bothered to file a Bugzilla. Um, I can't do anything about Bugzilla's interface myself, but I can help show people, you know, how to get around and do things in it. So I'm going to click on the new button up here and zoom in on this site too. After it loads. All right, that should be a little more readable. So we're filing an Apple bug. What you want to do is go into uh, the Fedora products and then Fedora Apple. Or sorry, that was Fedora classification, I think, and then Fedora Apple product. All right, and you can start typing here for the component name. Make sure to do that part first because if you start filling out the description and then change the comp and then then set the component, it'll it'll reset the description field. All right, and we see here you can you select your component that matches the package's source name, the same same page we were looking at here in uh, here in Diskit. And then for uh, for the version, you select the branch that we're talking about. Right now, uh, it's the Apple nine package that's having trouble installing. Summary. Um, this is not enforced or anything, but one habit that I have is I like putting the package name again at the beginning of the summary. Um, that way it shows up in the subject line of email notifications. Um, just a small tip that I do, it's not required at all. Um, I could also put the branch name in the subject line. That doesn't hurt either. It's, it, it'd be duplicated from the virgin, version, but again, it makes it real quick at a glance to see um, to see from the email subject line that people will get what it's about. I'll say fails to install from Apple 9. Apple will show you this handy little uh, pop-up with uh, possible duplicates. It's finding a lot of stuff similar with the word Apple 9, but none for this package. So None of those possible duplicates apply. Uh, the description of the problem. In fact, for this, I'm just going to copy the error directly from the Willet page. And I also need the package, what we call the NVR there, uh, for this report. So description. Um, The dehydrated package fails to install um, CentOS Stream 9. So I mentioned the uh, 
this identifier here. This is what we call NVR. This is something that a lot of packagers take, kind of take advantage that people know what that means. You know, when we're talking, like when I'm talking to like uh, Neil or Michelle, they know what I mean when I say NVR right away, just instinctively. It's the name version release. But for anyone that's newer to packaging, uh, it's that's what it stands for: name version release. And it is the it's the identifier that Koji uses to identify the build, and it's split up uh, with these hyphens here. Uh, Whenever I'm parsing this in Python, I, I look at it as a as an R split, max split two. And so basically from the right, everything up to the first hyphen is your release field. And then everything to the next hyphen is your version. Everything after that is the package name. That comes into play sometimes when you see packages that have like a major version in the name, um, like Python 3, for example, is a common one. Uh, the three is not part of the version, it's part of the name. So, um, I, sometimes I see people ask me what this how reproducible means. Uh, the best answer I've seen for that is whether it's a consistent error or like an intermittent error. Um, sometimes I just delete it if it's not if it's not relevant. Actually, I'm going to move this actual error message into the actual results. You can delete any fields that aren't really relevant, like the additional info. I don't have anything extra to share, so I'm just going to remove it. And this looks like a solid bug report, I think. Any suggestions in the chat of something I'm missing, leaving out? Yeah, epochs. Thankfully, there's no uh, epoch involved here. Let's see a question here. Uh, Peter's want to know how do I add a package to Apple Nine? Okay, we can go. Th I'll go through that uh, next. Let me close. Submit this bug report. That's a good, good, great suggestion. That looks solid to me. Submit bug. Uh, just It just occurred to me after I hit submit, what I could have put in the additional info was a comment about how, and I can do it as an additional comment on the Bugzilla, but um, I might go back and add a little details that I see the problem is that the MailX, MailX command isn't uh, isn't available in CentOS Stream 9 or Apple 9. and um, But however, the user bin MailX command is provided by the SNL package from CentOS Stream 9. And so maybe... Um, you know, and I can actually just make that suggestion as a pull request on the spec file, which is another thing we can work through pull request in Diskit. Um, but I want to take a look at Peter's uh, question here. Oh, Neil's telling me I can amend the description. I forgot that that's a thing you can do. Which button is that, Neil? Oh, here we go. So a little bit of extra tip there of uh, maybe the maintainer there does want MailX. Maybe they've got other packages that require it and so they need it anyways. Or they agree that it's smarter to just require user bin MailX, which is allowed by the packaging guidelines, uh, especially whenever different package names provide the package uh, or provide that capability across releases like we're seeing between EL8 and EL9 here. All righty. So syslog ng. Search for that. All righty. I see Peter here is the maintainer, and he would like to add it to Apple 9. 
So the process for adding a package to Apple is, uh, it's for packagers, it's the same as adding it for uh, another Fedora branch. A lot, of a lot of Fedora maintainers don't have to do this that often because they've added it to Rawhide and then it just gets automatically branched for new Fedora releases as they come out. But if you're adding a new package, you can do a fed package requ request branch uh, F34, for instance, or F35. Like if you added a package to Rawhide today, you'd have to manually ask for F35 and F34 branches to get it into the current stable releases of Fedora. And it works the same way for Apple branches. Uh, I see Michelle added the command, the exact command in there that would be needed. Uh, fed package request branch Apple 9. Now that, that can only be run by people that are in the access list for this package. So that'd have to be added by Adder, uh, added by Peter, or the person that asked the question, uh, JPO or Imrunge here. One of those people would have to run that command. Uh, proven packagers cannot add, add branches or cannot request those branches like that. Even though we can have permissions to edit a lot of packages, uh, requesting a branch involves basically volunteering that you're going to maintain it in that branch. And that's not, that's outside of proven packager responsibilities. Uh, let's see. Yeah. In the current, Neil points out in the current director of the repo, um, fed package will auto detect which package you're talking about based on the repo you have checked out. Or alternatively, um, there is a flag. I think it's dash dash package uh, or dash dash repo. Yeah. It's dash dash repo that lets you tell fed package, ignore what director I'm in. Do it against this diskit repository. Yep. And there it is. I see the rest of the comments. And Neil also points out that I think this is about the uh, re requiring a path. It's only allowed if the alternatives are configured in the rail base package. Uh, they are. They're provided. Well, I don't know about the, the path is provided. I'm not sure if the alternatives are. I, may, I expect they would be if it was branched just from Fedora 34 and there's just no other alternatives than SNAIL. All right. And I know that uh, for a lot of people, you may want a package added to Apple that you don't necessarily maintain yet. Um, before I move on to that, though, does that more or less, uh, more or less answer your question, Peter? I see Neil's commenting that uh, SNL already has the alternative configuration. Yeah, I expected it would, that it was branched from Fedora 34 with no none or minimal changes. And, and that means it probably has the alternatives configuration, um, which that means that if someone were to add MailX to Apple 9, it would just work correctly. Just like if both packages came from the same repo, uh, the user wouldn't be able to tell. All right, so that covers syslogin G. Um, let me... What was the next thing I was going to go to? I am forgetting. And again, if anyone else wants, I don't know if I have to approve it or anything, but if anyone else wants to share their screen and come on and uh, voice their questions and chat, I, I, <clears throat> I definitely intended for this to be more of a conversation rather than just a presentation. Yeah, I see. Uh, I'm looking at the S nail thing, just like Neil did a second ago, and I see the user bin, user bin mail, and user bin mail X are paths that are uh, provided by that package. Only speakers mark people marked as speakers and hopping. Hmm. Then I. I'm fine with moving this to the hallway track where everyone can be a speaker. Or I could do a few more demos first and then we could do that. Mm, they're recording. Well, I'm not sure how much value uh, a, a recording of a Hackfest actually has. Oh, here we go. Sean can just add people. Or if we can just change the config to allow anyone to join and share their video, that would be ideal. Or less video and more audio, but both are welcome. All righty. Oh, I remember now the uh, package request proce process. So if you go to docs.fedoraproject.org, 
there is an Apple section in here, right in the middle. And in here, uh, over on the sidebar, we've got a request packages uh, link. And if we want to op open that up, this is a really useful guide uh, for pe for users to request a package in Apple. Um, and the scope of this is for when you're requesting a package you're not already the maintainer of. In fact, that is a great idea for improving this guide is adding a note in here about, um, about like with Peter's question, uh, he wants to branch his own package. We should probably add a section here just says, if it's your own package, here's the command you run, you're done. Um, and this is, uh, you, there's an edit this page button here. Anyone can send a pull request to do that. That's a free free idea for a documentation fix if anyone wants to do that before I can get to it. Um, another thing, another idea that I've seen suggested, someone was trying to follow this to add a package that didn't exist anywhere yet. Uh, we do have a note here that says when requesting a Fedora package for Apple, um, which is the scope of this guide. At, if the package isn't in Fedora yet, that's a separate process to follow, and Fedora has that documented over in uh, over in their join sig, I believe, where it talks about becoming a packager and adding a package into Fedora. Let's see. So I don't need to just read this to y'all, but this guide's really helpful. You can go through, and uh, if you're not a packager yourself, it describes how you can just you know file a Bugzilla and request it. If you are a packager, you can volunteer to be a co-maintainer of the package if they're not, you know, if the maintainer isn't, uh, isn't able to action that quickly or, or doesn't want to. Uh, I've seen that, seen that before where a Fedora maintainer isn't interested in maintaining Apple branches for whatever reason. Um, but they're not really allowed to block you from adding them if you want to get involved in co-maintaining the package. Uh, we've even got per branch access list stuff now where they can add you and you can, you would only have commit access on Apple branches, um, that's really not ideal. It's it's good that we have that capability. I don't. I'm not a big fan of that, uh, mainly because uh, I have I have a personal preference of keeping my spec files in sync between Rawhide branches and Apple branches whenever possible. Um, that's very, uh, RPM really facilitates that really well with its conditional system. Um, some people will prefer to have the spec files diverge in each branch, and that's that's fine. Uh, that's an alternative way to do it. But a lot of times I'll keep my packages in sync. So that way, when I'm doing a compatible version upgrade with no breaking changes, I can just commit it in Rawhide and then merge it to Apple with a fast forward commit. Let me catch back up on the chat here real quick. So Mike asked about contributors and using a, Recommended to use Fedora Review. Absolutely. Apple packages follow the rules for Fedora packages. Occasionally, something from the Fedora guidelines uh, won't make sense in the context of Apple, usually because the, I guess what you could call the Apple guidelines, kind of reflect the state of the Fedora guidelines at the time that that corresponding rel release was branched from Fedora. Or now, uh, in the new model, when CentOS Stream is branched from Fedora. So, there are things that could change in Fedora uh, packaging guidelines that only apply to Fedora and don't apply to an Apple branch yet. Um, by the same token, there's guideline changes that could happen that are targeted at an upcoming, upcoming change in Rawhide that won't ever apply to, say, Fedora 34 or 35. Um, usually when that happens, a note will be made in the packaging guidelines about that. Um, but yes, in general, every most everything that Fedora Review checks is going to apply directly to Apple packages. And it's always worth running on it just to see what the things are and verify that uh, this is something that doesn't apply or this is something that needs to be fixed. So can touch on the review process for Apple. Um, oh yeah, so same thing I was just talking about. Uh, and just to reiterate that, uh, the review process for Apple is just the Fedora package review process. If you're trying to get a package into, into Apple, uh, get it into Fedora first. Uh, there is a, uh, in fact, I should link that in the chat. I have that somewhere. Join the package maintainers. So this is a guy that will take you through how to uh, become a Fedora packager, how to get sponsored, 
uh, submitting your first package. Um, these are all, this is a really useful guide. Uh, I'll go ahead while I'm at, I'll here, I'll go ahead and link the uh, package request for Apple as well. So the idea is get it into Fedora and then you can just request an Apple branch because in the end, Apple packages are Fedora packages. Apple is part of the Fedora project, even though we kind of operate a little bit separately as far as uh, the target audience. Yes, and uh, Michelle also did, great, dropped a great link about uh, some of the caveats that I talked meant earlier about how when you're packaging for an Apple release, uh, some of the packaging guidelines won't apply anymore. Uh, some of these are things like uh, like scriptlets where uh, they used to be in the Fedora guidelines and they've been removed because they no longer apply, but they still apply to an Apple release. Um, and this this wiki page is far from complete. There's other small little things that uh, when you run into something, it's, it'd be great if you could uh, add a pull request, do a pull request here to improve these uh, edge cases of like, hey, here's this thing that you need to be aware of. Uh, here's a good good small example, G setting schema. Uh, this used to be in the Fedora guidelines. It's been removed, but for, uh, this is under the Apple 7 header. So when you're building an Apple 7 package, you still need to include these post, uh, post done and post trans scriptlets for things to work correctly, even though it's handled auto automatically now in Fedora. And based on, based on this only being in the Apple 7 section, I believe it also happens in Apple 8 and Apple 9 automatically as well. Um, I'm sure Neil will probably correct me if I'm wrong there. He is he has a great memory and knows this stuff just off the back of his hand. Uh, Michelle also points out if it's a Fedora package and you're just branching for Apple, there's no review required. That's correct. The review is for adding a new package. Uh, if you're at, if it's th the package is getting added to Fedora also, then yes, there's a review required for getting it into Fedora period. But then after that, branching for Apple is just a just a branch request, no review. Perfect. Neil confirmed what I, what the uh, what it appeared to be with the uh, with the G setting schema. It's just Apple Seven only. Everything else has it. So we can actually drop once Apple Seven, or rather, once uh, Rel Seven reaches its end of life and Apple Seven is retired, we can just remove this section entirely because it just won't apply. There's a lot of little edge cases in there that are useful. Apple Seven has most of them. Um, I imagine there are more things in Apple Eight than listed here, and we just have to populate that over time and. Surely, eventually, there will be an Apple 9 section on this page that uh, packaging things that are in Fedora, that as that changes, we'll have to up, add notes here about what what's stays on the old guidelines with Apple 9. Oh, another thing in the chat, Michelle pointed out that uh, in, very rare, in some rare cases, there are uh, there is such a thing as an Apple-only package. Um, that is allowed in when it is justified. Um, having a package that you only want to use on Apple is not a valid justification. It should be in Fedora, and then that will help you prepare. Um, that'll make that package available for Fedora users as well, and it'll also make it where uh, your package stays compatible with the rest of Fedora and is ready for the next version of Apple when that comes along. Um, I used to maintain a few packages like that uh, at my old job, I'm almost positive that nobody ever used them on Fedora. They were used on rail systems, but we still maintained it in Fedora and got heads up of upcoming, upcoming changes that prepared us to, for branching it for the next version of Apple. Um, some of those Apple only package examples. Um, one of the common ones we have now is uh, rail and CentOS stream. Don't ship all of the packages that are built. Uh, a good number of those are filtered out because of what uh, rail wants to support in the product. And, we have a process now where you can request those to be shipped in the code ready builder repository, which is, it is a, is a repo for unsupported packages, but still shipped and provided. But um, that's not a guarantee that you'll get that. Sometimes it, that requires the rel maintainer agreeing to uh, it's, there's still unsupported packages, but there's, it's kind of weird. There's unsupported. We don't ship it. And so we, you know, we don't care at all or unsupported, but we are shipping it. So to some degree, we're still going to expect people to file support cases and probably have some kind of limited support for it. Um, that's probably terrible wording and not an SLA of any kind, of course, all disclaimers necessary, but um, that's just the different level of expectations there. So the rel maintain 
it also ha can have an implication of even though the development package may not be supported, the library may be used in other parts of RHEL. And once the devil, de if the devil package isn't shipped at all, then the RHEL maintainer can do uh, library SO name increases, uh, breaking changes on that library. And as long as they rebuild all the RHEL packages at the same time, it doesn't break any kind of uh, support SLAs or the application compatibility guidelines for RHEL. Once that devil package is shipped in CRB, even if the devil package isn't main, isn't supported, uh, that could affect the support level of the related library. So that's why sometimes RHEL maintainers will say yes or no. Uh, if they do end up saying no to shipping a devil package, you can ship a an Apple only package in, uh, for the corresponding version that is basically the same as the as the RHEL and CentOS Stream spec file, but disables all of the all of the sub packages ex except the devil package. So it's a way to ship just the just the sub package that RHEL is not shipping, and then it it's necessary to keep that in sync with RHEL the RHEL spec file going forward. It's not an ideal solution, but it, sometimes that's just our last uh, our last option in order to unblock adding an Apple package that has a build requirement. And there there are a few other examples of uh, Apple only packages that um, one example might be uh, in in Apple. Or in in rel 8 there's a python 3.8 module stream you could add python 3.8 dash whatever uh, python packages that don't make any sense on rel or sorry don't make any sense on fedora but only and only makes sense for apple 8 supporting rel 8 that would be another example of an apple only package so you can see how that's it's not uh, it's not allowed in the general sense of just i don't feel like putting this in fedora but whenever it's justified it is allowed Let's see. Catching back up on the chat here. I see a deeper question from Matthew about uh, the naming convention of the of what I was just describing, uh, extra, dash extras versus dash Apple packages. Uh, Troy linked him to an Apple issue where we've been talking about it. And uh, that conversation is probably better had in that issue rather than me trying to rehash it all right here. Um, Neil also brought up limited arch stuff. Um, if I remember right, that was something that we allowed for Apple 7 and we discontinued in Apple 8. If we revisit that for some reason in the future for the limited arch stuff, it would probably be the same rules, uh, same rules as the devil package stuff. <laughs> Michelle, if you can't decide between dash Apple or dash extras, just use them both, right? <laughs> dash Apple extras. Why not both dot JPEG? All righty. It's really bumming me out that no one else can uh, join the session. There's nobody. I I set uh -huh. up to. Uh, oh. There we go. If you can't do it, you. It's set now to let anybody join, but I think you'll have to um, refresh. What are you talking it. about? I'm here. Yay! <laughs> there we go. Now, you don't want the to be a real conversation. We're here. Excellent. <laughs> Funnily cool. enough, I'm using a package from Apple 9 right now to do some work stuff. I'm uploading images that I build with the Kiwi Image Builder um, mm. into into uh, internal OpenStack stuff. It's like, ah, oh, yay. This is Apple being awesome. Oh, another thing I'll point out that uh, Troy just mentioned in the comments, um, the limited arch stuff, it's on the meeting agenda for next week's meeting. Uh, the Apple Steering Committee... Uh, who govern kind of the rules of uh, rules of Apple and uh, uh, when, whenever we need to change Apple policy, uh, we meet every week, uh, every Wednesday. Uh, the exact time, I'm not going to try and quote it because time zones suck, but it's on the, uh, I know what time it is for me, but it's on the uh, Fedora calendar, if you're familiar with that. Um, Fedocal, calendar.fedoraproject.org. Yeah, and I'll drop a link to it. 
it's so much easier now than when it was apps that Fedora project that oh my gosh yeah apps. like having a proper subdomain is better <laughs> a lot better so uh, I encourage everyone that's uh, wanting to get involved in Apple to just come to that meeting it's an open meeting um, we have member the the steering committee uh, we're identified members I guess but uh, we don't really have like voting or anything kind of the way we handle it is when when people are consistently showing up for the work at some point, we just say, Hey, uh, do you want to call yourself a member of the steering committee? And then it just kind of happens. So, um, show up, do the work. We decide by when the arguing stops, when the arguing stops, (laughs) then, then, then things happen. That's dangerous with you, Neil. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Hey, but it did happen. I'm teasing. Hey, there's Troy too. It kicked me off when I tried to. Another thing uh, I wanted to bring up that I haven't finalized yet. Uh, I've been trying to pick the best time for this. Uh, I'd like to start doing uh, something similar to this, actually. Uh, Apple office hours, where rather than having to wait for an actual conference uh, to do either Hackfest or ask questions or get assistance with you know bringing your Fedora packages to Apple, uh, just have a routine thing. I'm thinking maybe once a month, uh, kind of like, uh, like CentOS has office hours. Uh, I need to double check when the CentOS office hours are to not conflict with them. Um, they are the third, I, I want to say it's the third Wednesday of each month. Uh, but uh, let me check. I actually have it on my calendar. I can just, I can I'm wondering right if people now. would actually like having those on the same day, like having an office hours. Uh, uh, do not no? kill me with meetings, dude. Oh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> He's like, I, I, I don't mind like having one one day of the week, like just ruined with all my meetings stacked into it and then being free yeah. the rest of the week. But that's maybe that's not everyone. The problem is it, that would be great if like. If you didn't have any uh, other okay. meetings. <laughs> yeah, if I didn't have any others. Like uh, my my week really does suck. It is very difficult. Uh, you have the, next, uh, the next one that's in the, the video meeting, the central stream office hours is next Wednesday. Okay, so it is the so I think it's the it second is the Wednesday. third Wednesday. Is that third Wednesday? No, it's second. Mm, sec, second, right? Yeah, second. Second Wednesday. Second Wednesday. You're right. So there's it is also next. an IRC office hours listed. Oh. On Thursdays at uh, 5 a.m. my time, and well, that's not going to work. <laughs> well, literally, no one goes except apparently me at 5 a.m. So. I'm not, I, I'm not, not sure even what, awake. If, like I can't even if I can barely make it to the Open Sousa Project Board meeting on <laughs> every other Monday at seven in the morning. I don't think I'm going to make it to a five a.m. one. Yeah, me personally. Uh, if people don't think, start showing up for that, that's going to drop off the calendar. Seriously. Yeah, me personally, I don't really see the value of an IRC office hours over just having the IRC channel exist. Period. Yeah, right. That's what IRC <laughs> is, right? So. I think the added value of the office hours is being able to talk and verbally communicate and even see each other, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. I should stop sharing my screen. There you are. Is that better? Yep. So we went through filing a bugzilla. Uh, I hope that was uh, very entertaining for people. Um as far as anything else to screen share, I'll stop sharing for now, but I could share again if we have any other ideas of stuff that uh, we could walk through. Uh, I could do a pull request to fix the dehydrated spec file if anyone wanted to see that. That'd be useful. Yeah. Yeah, you should you should do that. I was actually working that on the on the back channel, but yeah, you do it. Oh, yeah, Robbie, you wanted to send that pull request, right? Yeah, why, don't, why doesn't Robbie show us? Yeah. Oh, I don't know if I could. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> do it. That's yeah. Nice. Cool. Yeah, do my demo for me. (laughs) This is supposed to be participatory, and that's why we had Sean reconfigure the room. I don't mind. I don't mind putting you on. I won't put you on the spot, Robbie. I can do the pull request for that. Let me get. If it was my, if it was not my work laptop, I would be all over it. I'm still Uh, trying to work uh, with this. I know. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. Let me get my Windows fixed and set up for this. Not all of us can be as lucky as Carl and everything that he's actually working on for work is also shareable to the public. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't say everything, but a good portion. All the stuff that matters. Okay. 
I guess before I go any further, I should go ahead and share this terminal. Why is my share button grayed out now? Are you only allowed to share once per session? Mine's um, also grayed out, and I assumed it was because you were sharing, but now yours is grayed out. So. Yeah. I'm not going to talk. That is mine's weird. not grayed out. Um, Maybe we're done with demos. <laughs> Yeah, uh, mine's not grayed out. I can click the button. Would it break the recording if I leave and come back to see if that gives me no. a it, it, as long as as long as there's somebody here? That's right. Out. All right. Well, let's try that real quick. Hi, Rich. Oh. Just so you know, so I clicked my button to see what it would do and now it's saying I have to it won't let me unclick it so I believe I have grabbed <laughs> um, I think just... you, you have to reload when that in that scenario well I'm gonna share a well not I'm gonna share and then unshare Woo! there you there go, we go. <laughs> that's the... we had a moment of inception but that's okay <laughs> I couldn't Carlos decide which. Can't rejoin anymore. Oh, there he is. There he is. All right. Now we can't hear you, Carl. Um, you come on back. Hey, Carl. Now? It was. No, you were worse. Now we cannot hear you. What? It's it's lower. Your audio is really low. Carl, I clicked on my share button even though it was grayed out, and it allowed me to share it. So, so we've all learned that the Hopin UI apparently is trash and does not actually respect what it actually shows you. <laughs> so now no, it might be any better at all. I cannot, I cannot click on it. Now we can hear you. You sound great. I didn't change anything. Oh, that's <laughs> oh gosh. So, anyways, so I hear I hear Troy that you had uh, accidentally locked or not locked, but like grabbed the screen share and it was waiting for you. Well, yeah, because it, but it was grayed out, so. Yeah. So give it a try just to see. Let us it doesn't seem to work now. Like I cannot click on it anymore. Oh. That's because the the developer that's live coding this session changed it. In the other room. Oh. All righty. So I already ran the first command before I remembered, like, oh, yeah, I want to share this. So um, in my packages directory, I did a fed package clone on the dehydrated package. How is that as far as zoom level? We can go in a little bit. That's perfect. Okay. That's decent. Yep. Yeah. All righty. So, so uh, what's almost saying? Carl, uh, yeah, yeah. So, hey, Mohan. are you trying to request some branch right now? So uh, that I, yeah. I just want to no. prepare myself. That's all. No, this one here. is already in uh, Apple oh. Mine. But yes, okay. that's a great idea, Mohan. If we could go through a branch request with you here, that's awesome. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be a good demo. fantastic. Peter we're, Snazik we're is trying time, to do the, yeah. Peter Snazik is trying to do the um, uh, syslog ng. Yeah. So that would be, if he does his branch request, then you can approve yeah. it, and then we can see it go. That would be great, yeah. Peter. If uh, yeah, if Peter, if you've already done the branch request, uh, drop the link, and we I can screen share that page. Uh, Mohan can process it, and then you'll have your branch. I've got to bail, but it's been great, guys. See you then. See you later, Michelle. Bye. See you later, Michelle. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Bye. So I'm going to sh look check out the uh, Apple 9 branch. Uh, one thing I want to check is if Rawhide and Apple 9 are on the same commit. Uh, oh, so looks like, uh, no, 35 mastery build and 36. So it looks like they've diverged. Oh, wait, no. I'm looking at the... Uh... Here we go. Yeah, this is what I was looking for. All right, so it's linear. Um, so in this case, because I mentioned having branches in sync before, um, my pre there's no difference other than an extra change log entry between where Apple 9 is pointing and where Rawhide is pointing right now. Uh, that's good. That makes this really easy. I'm just going to submit this as a pull request to Rawhide because it's technically correct there as well. Um, because with this dehydrated package, let's say somebody wanted to have dehydrated but prefers to use S-Nail instead of Mail-X. Um, 
the current requires would force them to also have MailX installed, even if they ha don't have it configured with the alternatives to use. So this change is correct for Rawhide as well. I'm going to send it there and then uh, just add a comment that once it's in merged, it can be uh, it can be merged back to the Apple Nine branch as well. Uh, so I'm going to take a look here. Um, Neil Offhand, do you know if Fed Package Fork has that been implemented, or do I need to do that in the Web UI still? Uh, I think Fed Package Fork exists. Yeah, the command the command is there. I don't know if it. Oh, that's a thing. Yeah. 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 You do need your diskit token stuff. And I think that was the part that's been tricky for a while where oh, for a while yeah. SRC.fedoraproject.org didn't let you set the necessary token permissions. Oh, even though is that a different one from pager.io? It's different from the one from Pagar.io. You need the one for SRC.fedoraproject.org. I won't I won't troubleshoot setting the token stuff right now, but uh it's pretty it's similar to GitHub. I went in the web interface, the dehydrated diskit that I was showing earlier. There's a fork button. I clicked it, and once I have the fork, I copied the uh, copied the SSH URL for the remote. Uh, get and remote. No, get remote add. And this is the that's the URL I just got out of the web UI. So now I have the origin, which is the main the authoritative repo, and then my fork. Uh, I am going to check out a new branch. I'm going to call it. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to because I'm doing it off of Rawhide. I'm going to do the fix in Rawhide first. Let me go back over there, and I'm going to call it um, mail requirement. And now. And a little comment about why I'm changing it. Um, just out of curiosity, I'm going to see if there's anything else that provides that. Nope, just those two, MailX and Snail. So I just realized that other terminal I switched to is really small. Uh, if anyone's curious what I just did, this is... Uh, I just started a Fedora 35 container and uh, what provides, that's just an alias I have for repo query. What provides? That is a fantastic tool that I like to use repo query um, that lets you query what's in the repos and doesn't look at what you currently have installed at all. I find that more, more useful and more correct than like doing uh, like DNF provides personal opinion. Uh, Sometimes that output will get junked up with stuff of what you currently have installed. And maybe if you're troubleshooting like some third party packages, it gets the output gets really weird and just unexpected results. So if I want to look at what's in the repos, I prefer repo query. Uh, oh, and that, that F35, that's also an alias for running, uh, running the container. All righty. So I think this covers it. Uh, Neil, you mentioned earlier about, um, this is only allowed when the alternatives are configured. I thought that uh, even without the alternatives configured, if the if the binary is provided by a different package in different releases, that this is allowed. No, because that is totally con that is considered conflicting with the base. So, like the whole idea is that you should be able to repo closure and, in theory, fully install Apple on top of Rel base, and no Rel packages would conflict or be substituted or whatever. So, like. For example, okay. So uh, in this case, because a rel package Snail and a uh, and a Fedora and a potential Apple package MailX would provide the same path, it has to be alter alternatives, is what you're saying. Right. So, okay. like, for example, I remember what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of yeah. like if the package name changed in Fedora and in each Fedora release, only one package provides that name using the path is correct and and uh, right. allowed. Okay. Right. So, like, so for example, if you have uh, more concretely, you probably can't have Pulse Audio or Jack in Apple because that would conflict with the Pipewire uh, implementation that is provided in RHEL, in RHEL base. Right. 
not that I think you'd actually want to, because like that would yeah. create a whole host of other issues. But right, that that's the what, what you're of, talking like, about. That isn't allowed. Isn't the isn't specifying the requires by path. It's spec. It's having the path exist in an Apple package that conflicts with the rail package. That's the part that's not bingo. allowed. Yeah, I remember yep. seeing some discussion or, previously about um, about requiring paths and how it's not the best thing to do, but in certain cases like binaries provide being provided by different packages and different releases, how it's the best workaround, the least bad option. All right. So that looks good. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bump the change log for this. Here's a little tool I like to use called RPM dev bump spec. That's really useful. Um, require, um, I'm going to find that bug that I filed earlier, copy that identifier, and stick it in here. Two zero five zero eight five two. Yeah. Now, if I look at my git diff of what's currently different, uh, that RPM dev bump spec command, you can see that in incremented the release field. Um, make sure that that worked correctly. That it's a uh, like a it knows how to handle like a simple four macro disk to five macro disk. If you've got a more complicated release macro, uh, like if you're you're interpolating other macros to determine that release, or if you're doing some kind of snapshot thing in there, or if you've got like a trailing dot one on it, things can get a little bit weird. So just verify, make sure that did exactly what you think it did. Um, the actual change looks correct, and then the change log entry looks correct. All right, so I'm going to commit my changes. For the commit message, I'm just going to copy the change log entry. And I'll do one other trick here. I'm going to split the bugzilla onto a separate line and I add the word resolves in front of it. This does some interesting magic whenever uh, whenever the Bodhi update is created. All right, so I'm going to do a, uh, just for, for help, I know this is not going to work right away, but a git push. And git helpfully reminds me that I haven't set up an, a tracking branch for my local branch mail requirement. So I'm going to set that instead of the example it says, says to set it to origin, but I don't want to put it there. I want to put it on my fork. So we're going to push that up. And we're going to have a, it's going to give us a helpful URL here. Um, let's see if I can switch my share. There we go. I need to zoom out a little. All right. So that this is that link that it just gave me uh, in the uh, in the terminal, and it's going going to be going for my my fork on the mail requirement branch to dehydrated rawhide uh, requires a path. And uh, I mean, you can add extra stuff here. It just grabbed this all out of the commit message, but I think that's pretty concise and covers what it needs to. So I'm going to hit create pull request. I guess I can't show what this, what that resolves thing does without, uh, without merging it myself, which I shouldn't do without normally things like this. Um, I could actually merge this. I'm in the proven packages group, but kind of the, the status quo there. And I think it's probably documented in the rule somewhere is that, um, you don't want to just make changes everywhere just because you can, you want to do the smallest changes possible to fix the problem you're working on and ideally do it as a pull request and give the maintainer some amount of time to comment. Like if, they prefer a different implementation. Um, you know, that that can kind of depend on the severity. Um, like if there's something that's breaking, you know, breaking other packages that might get pushed through right away. If it's, uh, if it's something like this, that's already broken and no one's even noticed because I had to file the bug for it, then, uh, then it's something maybe wait, maybe wait a few days or a week even to give the maintainer a chance to respond and comment on it. Um, but once it's built, once it's merged, it can be built in Rawhide. And then uh, the Rawhide build will automatically clo close out this Bugzilla because of that resolves line that I put in there. <clears throat> the next step after that would be to merge the Rawhide branch into the Apple 9 branch, do an Apple 9 build, um, 
And actually, now that I think about it, this bug was filed against Apple Nine, so that's not actually correct. But it's. Yeah, I was about to ask you, like, what 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 happens if the maintainer kind of like, like they just like take off or like not not respond timely. To 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 that. Uh, so for something like this, uh, like I said, in this case, it's weird because I'm also a proven packager, but uh, like, let's say Robbie, you filed this pull request and after a week you brought it up to me cause we were talking about it and you said, Hey, uh, the maintainer hasn't answered me and I really like to get this fixed so we can fix the Apple package. Uh, a proven packager can go in and merge one of these pull requests and get it built. Um, and then that will get it handled. Um, like I said, I kind of set this up a little bit weird with the bugzilla just against, uh, Apple nine, I guess, technically this pull request on the rawhide branch, doesn't actually resolve that bugzilla. It would be once it's merged into the Apple nine branch, then it would, but it's close enough. Let's see, I'm behind on the chat here. Just to reiterate that it's, it's a personal uh, preference of the, the package maintainer on whether or not they want to, um, I guess, branch everything off of rawhide. Are you talking about like the diverging branches? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a bit of preference. I do notice, I would say the majority of maintainers like that. So that way they can up do a change in rawhide and just merge it back cleanly with a fast forward commit. Um, but that's not required. And I have seen some maintainers that uh, they might look at you sideways and say, why did you send this to rawhide? It doesn't affect rawhide. But in this case, it technically does because of what I mentioned about uh, on Fedora, you may want dehydrated and snail X and don't need mail X installed for anything else, but you would get it installed even though you had your alternative switch to snail. Yep. All right. Also, this change makes it compatible for Fedora ELN, which makes a relish uh, Fedora for people and would be able to compose all those extras and be able to install them properly. So you do want whatever stuff you're working on to fix Apple packages, I, ideally should actually also be in Rawhide so that they affect the next Fedora releases and eventually the next RHEL through ELN and ELN Extras, which is another whole thing that Troy is working on, sort of. Gotcha. Okay. Y'all are funny about the token. And then uh, I like Mike's uh, fork remote uh, name better. <laughs> I usually use my username. Um, that's not any kind of requirement or anything. I just do that because sometimes I'm dealing with other people's forks as well. Um, so it makes it really easy to just say my fork, you know, Davida's fork, Robbie's fork. Peter also. Well, that's better than like What's that? Unix time. That's better than Unix timestamp for me. <laughs> One six two two three one four. Uh, Peter brought up in the chat about uh, the new auto release and auto change log stuff. Uh, I think that project's called Auto RPM Spec. Um, that is super nice and useful, and it works. As far as I know, it works in all Apple branches. Um, that is a thing you can do in your spec file, where instead of setting the release manually and doing a change log manually, you put in the auto release and auto change log macros and optionally a separate changelog file from historical changelog entries. But then from the point that the separate changelog file got added, it will Koji will generate a changelog from the git commit messages. It is super nice and useful. It's a little bit limited because it's limited to like single line commit messages. That's the only thing that shows up in the changelog. Uh, so like having the resolves on a separate line doesn't work and uh, some other stuff like that. But uh, it's still really useful and makes maintenance for uh, for a lot of package for simple packages really easy. Well, I hope people start putting more descriptive comments as opposed to fix or <laughs> you know, sometimes yeah. you get those and it's like uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the idea, but I think that's why that tool only does the I guess the subject of the commit message, not the whole thing, because the entire thing may be a longer description of why and justifying it. Uh, something you, you wouldn't necessarily want to put the entire thing in the RPM change log, but um, I don't know what the right balance is there. I think that's some discussion that's ongoing with that project about how they want to handle those things. And uh, I think the main pain point is that using the auto release stuff, it's not currently close, not currently closing rawhide bugs with the, uh, with the rawhide Bodhi build. So maybe just solving that in a different way is the right answer. 
Hmm. Also note that if you're if you have the right magic phrases in your spec file and in your git commit, um, Bodhi will just add them to your updates for you when you do Bodhi yeah, updates. I have, I have noticed that. So it's there's a lot of like subtle automation magic that unfortunately RPM auto spec has kind of broken. Hopefully that doesn't that only works on Rawhide though, right? No, that works for everything. Yeah, I did it last night on the 35, uh, Fedora 35 branch. To... I, must, I must have missed that then. It'll, it'll auto close the BZs, which is kind of annoying, but it'll also simultaneously add those BZs to a Bodhi update, which reopens them. So that's that's fun. Um, well, uh, but that's why I'm, just, that's why I manually do it because because I'm you know like with the KDE stuff, I'm pulling things over and I don't want to. And if I manually, it puts it in there and I take it out because I don't want to open up all the rawhide ones when I'm doing them on mm -hmm. FOA. I think I realize what it is, why I haven't seen that, because I probably fix it in rawhide first. The bug gets closed with the rawhide build, and then I do the so then I do the builds and submit the builds for you know F35, F34, and it probably doesn't automatically grab a closed bugzilla. Yep. No, it does. It'll it? it'll do it if you do it with Bodhi update, but if you do it through the web UI, it never does. That's what okay. Oh, God, gotcha. it doesn't work if you use a side tag unless you pass dash dash close bugs or whatever to Bodhi. Yeah, well, side tags have a whole special set of behaviors that um, I don't think we've we've fully worked out yet. All the uh, ejections in the updates that you are seeing, most of them is related to the side tags. Yeah. Yeah, I only recently learned you can tag and untag arbitrary packages in a side tag, which is really powerful, but you can also do some like hurt yourself pretty badly with that. <laughs> I'm thinking of the time somebody actually tagged in an old GCC package, forgot to untag it before merging the tag, and we got we got all kinds of interesting brokenness <laughs> with mismatched yeah. GCC packages. Huh. Hey guys, it's the top of the hour, and I need to to head off. So it's good seeing you. Thank you for doing the hackfest, Carl. Sure this thing. Is great. Hopefully, we can do them again in the future. Yep. Hopefully, we uh, have more more conversation at the beginning rather than just me talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, you did a good right. job talking to yourself. I don't so, know how how people that do like Twitch stream and do it. That's it's super annoying to me. <laughs> with a lot of pretending. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of pretending involved to make that like not feel weird. Yeah. Well, I'm going to stick around for a little while longer if anyone else wants to. Uh, feel free to leave if you need to. So, uh, Neil, I I think that there, there was supposed to be a flag uh, when you create Bodhi updates new. There is a flag that will disable automatic closing of busy bugs. Oh, really? Okay. That might actually be um, useful because I really don't want it doing that. <laughs> Not all the time, especially when I'm making Apple stuff, because most of the time I leave the BZ references in, but I don't want them closing the bugs because they're not to be closed for that reason. How uh, was the Bodhi demo done? Carl, do you want to do like some kind of Apple Bodhi thingy? I don't Can have you a build do some kind of Apple Bodhi thingy. I don't have a build handy at this exact moment to do one. Hey, there's a flag to Fed package for the for the update that it's no not close uh, ticket. Not close. Yeah, let me learn to read again. Uh, <laughs> I just lost it. Not close bugs. And you can pass it through Fed package update. All right. So, Mike, I don't have a Bodhi update to submit right now, but I can kind of, I think I can walk through, uh, walk through it for the most part. Uh, so, Bodhi, for anyone not familiar, Bodhi is the, uh, the update system we use for Fedora and Apple. And the idea is, is that um, once you do a build in Koji, the build system, you can either from the command line or from uh, from this web interface, you can go in here and do a new update. Um, see what Python packages are available. Python flit. Uh, Michelle, are you still on? This looks like yours. Oh, Davida is still here. Did you already submit Tmux P? Yes, that was mine. That also doesn't work from what I remember. Uh, it was missing some runtime dependencies. Well, that's that's fine. I won't submit. I won't hit submit, but I just want to use it as I an example here. Bug. 
So uh, you type in your uh, that NVR identifier that we talked about earlier. Uh, that corresponds to the Koji build. You can do multiple builds. Um, in fact, sometimes I sometimes I've messed up and uh, done separate Bodhi updates for things that actually depended on each other and needed to go in one update together. Um, and that and you you may think, oh, that works fine because they go in if you do the first one first and then it hits its time first and then the second one. But then if the second one gets karma and the first one hasn't, then you've got a package that won't install. So uh, pay pay attention to grouping things together when it's appropriate. Uh, you can fill in a description here, you know, like first package for Apple 8. Pretending this is probably already, uh, David, I was saying he already added this one. But you just add whatever description here. Um, if you were doing like a routine package update, maybe you include a link to the upstream change log, um, any notable features or packaging changes like... Uh, like for that dehydrated one, maybe adding a note that now includes a system D timer, things like that. Uh, a few different types you can specify for the update, uh, like a new package, an enhancement, or just a bug fix. Um, Does that do I'm, anything besides changing the icon? Uh, DN, uh, DNF updates security in Fedora. Oh, right. And I guess technically that also works in F for Apple packages, even though it doesn't work for the base operating system for, uh, for CentOS Stream. But uh, the one where I fall down is if it, it has a uh, if it is a has new features and bug fixes, uh, <laughs> like some combination. Like I I think I usually make it an enhancement at that point. Oh right, because enhancements would be feature and bug fixes just fixes. That makes sense. Like it's hard to specify multiple types. Um, I guess that's, that's wrong because down. if it includes a bug fix at all, it should be listed as bug fix because yeah. of DNF update security. Hmm. That drop down could use a call out with an explanation of what the various things. Yeah, are. I could. could say like, what happens if you miscategorize that accidentally? Like, you put enhancement, Nothing. or you put new package when it should be enhancement, for example. Nothing happens. <laughs> okay. Well, the only one I'm, I'm aware of that has any implication at all is the security one, and it just it identifies it as a security fix when you're doing the um, when you're doing DNF commands that like the dash dash security flag. Well, let's say we pick one there. Um, and all of these also can be left unspecified if you're not sure. Um, they're just useful in, useful to indicate uh, what the update is when people are looking at it. Uh, I know I know I I'll go through and look at what's in updates testing uh, or Apple testing on my systems sometimes, and see like oh yeah I do want to go ahead and get that security fix you know early or oh that's a good feature that or oh that's a breaking change I wonder if they know that that's not allowed in Apple or in a stable Fedora release and things like that. Um, so you can set, you know, severity and there's also a suggestion field here for if, if a reboot is necessary or logging or just logging out like of a desktop session. Uh, looks like there's, a, if you click in the bugs field, it'll show you the currently open bugs for that. Um, if you pick that, it'll add it into the list. Um, and you have an option here to close the bugs on stable or not close them. Um, I know Troy was mentioned earlier that he'll uncheck that uh, sometimes or most of the time. That's just personal preference. That's why it's a toggle right here. Um, this require bugs thing. Um, so there in Bodhi, when you're giving uh, karma on an update is what we call it. In fact, let me let me show what that looks like. I can give you one to plus one. Can you give you me? A, can you give? I have an update that you could give me karma for. That'd be super <laughs> exactly. helpful. <laughs> not, this is a time not, offense not, now. <laughs> not, not about testing. I can see it on my own update here. That, uh, anyways, there's two two separate lines here. Uh, you get an overall karma for the bug, and that's that counts for the uh, stable by karma settings uh, or unstable by karma. And then there's also um, each bug that you list when you're creating the update gets its own karma line. Um, doing a thumbs down on the bugzilla won't fail the update. Uh, only the overall thumbs down does. Or not just fail it, but also only the overall one counts for the stable and unstable by karma. Um, I've seen that before where someone was surprised that something moved to stable after getting negative karma and it was because they gave the negative karma on the bug itself, not the overall one. It's a little bit unintuitive. Uh, so I like to point it out for people to know maybe that's something that can be fixed in future versions of Bodhi. But that is what... Um, that's what the require bugs thing is. If uh, 
could you could you go into some some I, I kind of I'm I'm really new at this process. Sure. Um, the Taskatron checks, like you're, you're creating like uh, I remember somewhere in the in the Fedora packaging guidelines, like writing tests for reviewers or something. Is that what that's related to? I honestly don't know anything about Taskatron. I skip over that part. Neil, do you want to comment on with your history lessons? Sure. Uh, how dare you? Uh, <laughs> it's a compliment. You have a so, great memory. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. So Taskatron <laughs> was something that the Fedora QA folks invented like 20, I think it was Tim Flink at Red Hat who made it um, somewhere between 2013, 2015. Um, it replaced a couple of other things that we were using at the time. And Taskatron, I think, is actually in the process of also being retired and replaced with something new, um, with the Zool based CI being a thing and some other stuff. Um, basically, what the uh, the required test cases now goes to, um, Taskatron is being used kind of like a harness to run them. But what it does is it goes to, if you go to src.fedoraproject.org slash tests, there's actually, for every source package name, there's a bunch of um, if there, if a package has like some universal tests or whatever that could be used across the board, they're put in there or they're super complex tests. They're, they're checked in there. Uh, or in a package repo, you can see there's a test subfolder. For example, if you look at the snapd diskit, um, repository, there's a test subfolder with a couple of basic tests. Those are executed by the test harness, which is then the results are processed by Taskatron and fed back into Bodhi. And required test cases mean all of them have to pass or the update or the tests have to be waived for the update to actually land in stable. Okay. Do a lot of packages packagers do that? Do they, a lot of people do that? I haven't seen a whole Most lot. Most people don't know how to make tests. Wow. Yeah. Um, so one of the slightly annoying failings I think right now is most people don't understand how to make the tests. I kind of barely understand how to make them, which is why SnapD has them. But um, but the the package tests, as it currently stands, are mostly around the packages that Red Hat has considered being eventually part of RHEL, and so that they built out those test cases and part of opening up that test suite to the Fedora stuff, to ELN, to CentOS Stream. Um, pro tip and interesting factoid. The tests for CentOS Stream are on source.fedoraproject.org. They are not on GitLab.com because they're in the test namespace and they're executed from there on CentOS Stream and GitLab. Really? That's weird. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they're using the test everywhere, basically. One copy for everything. Yep. Do those tests have separate branches for, the, for, for Stream 9 versus Fedora? I don't think so. Although Mohan might know more. Um... I think you can create the branches, but I'm not entirely sure. But uh, I I've just, just wanna... never seen any. Yeah. Uh, the Taskatron is uh, currently, as Neil said, it's just a, uh, it's it's old, but uh, the UI is still there, uh, which uses Waver DB, Results DB, and GreenWave stuff to uh, run the CIs. And uh, Result DB is the place where the uh, CI results are stored. And uh, WaverDB is the place where you can specify a test to say if it fails, don't worry about it. So you can set those things as well. And uh, GreenWave is sort of a, like if all tests you know passes, just push the thing uh, forward. So it's a combination of uh, several services. But the actual Taskatron is dead. Mm -hmm. Well, I usually, either way, I usually skip over this part um, just because it's not clear and I haven't used it. Um, the other stuff in this final one, you can give, an, you can optionally give a an explicit name to your update. Rather, if you don't fill that out, it's just a list of the MVRs you you included. Um, which, if for a single for a single package, uh, it's not a big deal. It's a perfectly fine name. If you've got a if you've got a hundred things you're submitting in one update, maybe consider giving it a more descriptive name than just a list of the first two and then a runoff dot, dot, dot. Uh, I don't know. It works out well for the KD plasma ones. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, optional name. Um, I just skipped the task of Trump part. The, uh, 
You can also, here's a checkbox for uh, auto requesting stable based on karma. Um, I mentioned the karma earlier. And what that does is you can have it where uh, once your package gets a certain number of thumbs up, it will automatically get promoted uh, or get queued up for promotion to the stable repos. Um, that's normally what I want. Um, that may not be what everyone wants. And then there are definitely situations where I want it to stay in testing for a certain amount of time, despite the karma. The karma is nice and useful, um, and you still get an you you still get the option to manually push it to stable once you get the necessary karma or you meet the time threshold. Um, I guess then talk about that part. There's two ways that Bodhi updates get into stable. They either meet the karma threshold or the time based threshold, um, and then after it meets one of those. It either, based on these check boxes, it will either, or ra radio boxes, I guess, sliders? What would you call that UI thing? Whatever. Uh, based on these settings, it will buttons. either, yeah, it'll either automatically move into stable or you'll get an option to manually push it to stable once the, the threshold's met. Um, the auto, auto thing here, that's set, uh, set that way because different branches have different, um, different time thresholds. It's not the same across everything in Bodhi. Um, I, Apple, Apple used to be two weeks. We recently voted on the steering committee to drop that down to a week. Um, the thinking was that uh, after a week, m most updates for Apple sit in testing for two weeks with no comments or karma at all. And then they just automatically get promoted. Uh, the idea is that if someone's going to be testing it and giving it karma, it's going to happen within a few days. A week is a good enough threshold and it'll help pa Apple packagers move just a little bit faster. Um, I believe that it also matches me out because it's yeah. been a lot. Because like I'm pushing, I think between me and Davida, I think we've been pushing somewhere close to like a hundred or so of these things. It's it's a lot for ramping up. It also matches what the uh, the time based threshold for stable Fedora releases as well, which uh, I like. I like that alignment. Um, and something you brought up, Neil that. That actually probably was a good contributing factor in how fast Apple 9 has been growing. Um, I haven't thought about that part before. Well, yeah, there are people like people aren't really using the side tags so much because the, the dependency webs are so messy at this point because we're we're just starting that side tags are difficult and overrides are expensive. So what people are doing is just waiting for them to land and then proceeding to the next phase as it keeps going. So we start, we see these like meteoric jumps like every two weeks, because that's when you see a huge cluster of stuff land in Apple. Mm -hmm. Plus it's super difficult to test against things that are in overrides or in updates testing when you're using mock locally. Yeah. I was going to ask about that. Cause I, I had, a, I had that exact issue and I ended up waiting for something to get pushed through. And then oh, just we should talk me. about uh, overrides. Because <laughs> I, I don't know how you would locally do that with mock or you know mock build. I, I'm I'm still a little hazy on that. So in Bodhi, I mentioned the update system and how that works. There's also an override system. Um, and what this does is it lets you add a package into um, into the Koji build route. Uh, and I'll get to in a minute how you can make that get the same effect for your local builds. Um, but as far as for their actual builds or for scratch builds, you'll add the package in VR in this field and set an expiration date. And then uh, I think it maxes out like a month or four or five weeks, something like that. Uh, and then you can add any additional notes. Uh, I, I'm usually pretty, pretty terse there. And I'll say like build requirement for whatever, you know, whatever I'm working on. Um, a lot fewer options there. Once it's in there, you can uh, you can open it up. Uh, it even gives you a helpful command you can run. Uh, Koji wait repo that'll uh, and the the build route that it's targeting it determines that automatically based on the uh, based on the disk tag or the what or the build that it was uh, the build route it was built against probably actually. So running that command will tell you it usually takes 15 minutes, maybe something like that. Sometimes longer for it to actually show up. And you can see this one has notes that it's a, that this package is a build requirement for going itself for doing some kind of update. Um, 
in your mock configurations, there should be a local repository. And that can be, it's in there by default in the mock core configs, and it, but it's off by default. If you go in there and turn that on, that will give you the Koji build route uh, as one of your repos during your mock build. Gotcha. Alternative to doing, uh, the alternative to figuring it out locally is to just always do scratch builds. Maybe not always, but in that case, if you need something that's in the build route and you don't want to hassle with turning on the local repo for uh, for your local mock builds. Plus, there's a few complications with how the local repo works with uh, Apple Next that I don't remember all the details on. But either way, it's, if you want to make sure that it builds in Koji, do a scratch build. Yeah, it's all messy and terrible. The easiest option is just do scratch builds. The least bad option. That yeah, do do that too. Do that a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's what I do. I do uh, if I have to figure out the build uh, depths and everything. I just do scratch builds and try to figure out. Well, now I should try using eBranch. Yeah, eBranch looks really cool looking. Yeah, eBranch is like the twenty percent of the way there to that world where. This build system can auto discover this, make the request, build it, and submit it all together like it should. Mm. So, I mentioned scratch so builds, close. and I haven't really talked about them much. Uh, our build system, Koji, you can create a build. Normally, you have a build, and it gets, um, I guess, you start a task, and then for a real build, it will have a corresponding build created for that task. Um, I'm describing this weird, it's a strange concept, but basically you can do a task that never gets a build and that is called a scratch build. I'm probably all over the place with the terminology here, but that's the way that it kind of works. Um, the idea is that it's, it's a build that never can be official and go into any repos or anything. Yes, It has no real definition. Think of a scratch build like you would if you're like um, doing like... Um, you know, an experiment with some scratch paper or whatever, or a sure. scratch model where you're iterating on something, but you, you don't really want to present it to anyone. It's not for public consumption. That's, mm -hmm. that's essentially a scratch build. So here's uh here's one I did earlier. I was taking a look. Uh, Python H2 is something that I'm going to need as a build requirement for another package. And before I ever even contacted the maintainer, uh, I checked it. I cloned down the repo. And uh, with Fed package, you can even before the branch exists, you can specify uh, what branch you want it to build against with the dash dash release flag. And so, just from the rawhide branch uh, that I have checked out, I just did Fed package dash dash release Apple nine scratch build. It ran through. Uh, it started a task, and it failed. Uh, if it passed with no problems, uh, I would. Um, I would probably take that task and copy it and use it in my Bugzilla requesting an Apple 9 branch saying, look, it's easy. See, I already does a scratch build passes successfully. Um, but we can switch to my browser window again. These would be quicker buttons for this. You need a stream deck. <laughs> <laughs> Just to switch. I had the whole window. <laughs> so here is that task. And like I said, a scratch build it's a weird terminology because it's not a build in Koji. It's just a task with the option scratch equals true. It never creates a Koji build, but it's a build. It's, it's super weird terminology overlap and stuff. Um, but as you can see, we, we, uh, it tried to build it against Apple nine candidate. Uh, it failed. It's a no arch package. So if there, if this was not a no arch package, it would have multiple architectures here. Um, let's go and see what the error is. It's probably, uh, probably missing build requirements. All right, so we open up the, the task for just the, the, this architecture and let's look at the root log. Oh, the, looks like the root log actually finished. I'm not sure what this is telling me. Requirement not build. satisfied wheel. Uh, you know what this looks like? 
Uh, I'm thinking that the generate build the Pi Project generate build requires didn't get run because I've seen something similar to that before. Hmm. No, it does. Hmm. I'm not sure what the error is on this one, but that's basically how you do a scratch build and you can start troubleshooting and you don't even have to do a local build with it if you're waiting for something that's in the build route. Um, yeah, I am puzzled on that exact error. Does the package have a new enough... Uh, um, does Python 3 dist wheel exist? Yeah, that's Python 3 setup tools wheel is getting installed. That's not the same thing. Is it the pip yeah. wheel one? You you know, that's not the same thing either. There should be a Python 3 wheel. Uh, that's the thing that's missing. How is that not there? Is it, would that be in, uh, in the spec file? You know what no, we can no. do to troubleshoot this is let us go to oh, it doesn't have the link here. Um, Python three wheel is in CRB. It's in stream nine. So why is it not getting pulled in? Out of curiosity, let's look at the uh, the rawhide the last rawhide build for this, which should be the same being built from the same spec file. Uh, and we can go to the log. Yeah, sure enough, Python 3 wheel is getting installed on Rawhide and not on Apple 9. So that seems to be the problem. But looking at the specs oh. all, I don't see why it's getting a different behavior because it looks like the Pi Project makers are set up correctly. I saw something similar to this before where I had the... Uh, the Pi project build requires wrapped in a conditional for the tests and it doesn't just add the test requirements. It adds all of them, including setup tools. So I wonder if this is, but this, this one isn't wrapped in a conditional. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Further troubleshooting necessary. Hmm. You know, that, that, that is definitely the problem, I think, that wheel is not getting installed. As to why that's happening, I'm not sure. Nothing jumps out at me in the spec file. I might dig into that later and see if I can figure it out. Hmm. 